So I've got a joke for you. This blonde is in a plane, a clever blonde. And beside her is a distinguished lawyer who on the inside loves to play games. The attorney looks over at the blonde and says, hey, do you want to play a game to pass the time? She answers, I'm not very good at games. So the lawyer says, come on, it'll be fun. And the blonde answers, I don't know. So the lawyer says, I tell you what, well, I'll make it worth your while. Here's the deal. I'll ask you a question and you can answer me. And if you get the question wrong, you give me $5. But if I get the question wrong, I'll give you $1,000. So the blonde agrees. So the lawyer asks, first, who was the first president of the United States? The blonde thinks for a few minutes, straining her brain, finally gives up, says, I don't know. Gives him $5. The next, uh, it's the blonde's turn, so she asks the lawyer, what has five legs, five tails, five eyes, and seven mouths? The lawyer panics, calls two of his closest friends on the expensive jet phone line. They don't know. He gets onto the airline Wi-Fi network. He types in onto Google. Can't find anything. Finally, he tells the blonde, I don't know. He gives her $1,000. He then asks the blonde, what's the answer? She looks at him and says, I don't know. He has five bucks. <laughs> Right, so we've been doing a series called Suit Up. I've loved hearing from all of our pastoral team as we've been learning how to put on what we already have. We're not putting on something that we don't have. And uh, last week, Yana spoke about the armor of God and how we need to be putting on the armor of God. And it's a, a way of thinking and a way of believing and a way of seeing ourselves correctly. And there's many scriptures regarding how we need to be putting off the old and we need to be putting on the new, which is my first point this morning, that we've always got to remember that we are putting on who we really are. We are not putting on who we are not. So God would never ask you to put something on if you didn't have what he's asking you to put on in your closet. And some of the scriptures we've read, Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Colossians 3, 12, put on therefore... As the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, because that's who God is. So he's saying, that's who God is, and because you're his child, put on these things. In 1 Corinthians 15, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. He's saying, put on who you really are, that you are an eternal being made in the image of God. Put that on as your reality. You know, scripture that doesn't change how I view myself will not benefit me. I've got to be reading the scripture and changing my sense of self. I need to be starting to see myself from God's perspective. This is how God sees me. Rather than how my culture sees me, how my past sees me, how society sees me, I mustn't allow those things to dictate who I am. He's saying I need to be putting on the way God sees me as my reality so that it changes my sense of self. See, if, if I'm hearing scripture, but it's not changing how I view myself, it's just information. And I'm gonna live feeling like a hypocrite because it's like, I know this is what the scripture says, but this is actually how I feel about myself. So we've gotta allow what scripture says about me to influence my heart so that I'm writing new beliefs on my heart so that I'm seeing myself the way God sees me. See, we are, we are changed, or let me put it this way, we behold what we become, we become what we behold. So, in the negative, if I see God as angry and distant and withholding, guess what? As I behold that image, I become angry, distant, and stingy. Because that's how I view God. I become like the God I believe in. So it's so important that I get the right view of God. And the right view of God has been demonstrated in the life, the death, 
the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. Because if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. So I need to interpret God through how Jesus lived his life and what he accomplished on the cross of Calvary and what happened when he rose from the dead. So if you're looking through a, to shoot a target, there's two sites. And the, the sites that we look through is agape love, the unconditional love of God, that God is love and the finished work of Christ. And so when I'm lining up to interpret any kind of scripture, I need to be lining it up through the love of God and the finished work of Jesus. And then I'll hit the target. But if I'm not interpreting scripture through those things, I'm not going to interpret them correctly. So transformation, because God's not asking you to change before he loves you. Hello? God loves and accepts you. So when I believe the truth of that, I'm transformed from the inside out. Because I'm believing the truth of who God is, and it's affecting my sense of self, because I'm writing new beliefs about who I am on my heart, and then it will affect how I treat people. Because then it's a natural overflow of my heart. So I need to be letting go of thinking, of thoughts, of perceptions that are not consistent with who I am in Jesus, as a new creature in Him. So this is not about trying to become something I'm not. No, this is it transforming into who I really am. Because it starts from the inside. God's not trying to force you from the outside to become something. No, He's showing you who you really are, and as you begin to see that, you are transformed from the inside out. And that is what, how God works. Okay, Colossians 3.14. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And God is love. He put on God, put on love, because that's who he is, and it's who you are. How you see yourself is extremely important, because it doesn't help you know the truth of God's word, but you feel like a loser. No, you've got to take the truth of what God says about you, how, he's, how he speaks over you. In Ephesians 1, 3, it says you've been blessed, God, well, it starts off. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. The word blessed there means to speak well of. So God is speaking well of you. He's spoken an affirmation over you that you are loved, that you are accepted. You are his workmanship. The word workmanship there means love poem. You are his love poem. That you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are the apple of his eye. So he speaks this affirmation over you, but if I'm not going to believe it in my heart, it's not going to affect my sense of self. So I'm, I need to believe what God says about me. You remember the spies, how they were given this promise by God, and the spies went into the land, and they came back with a report. Well, let's read it, in case you can't remember it. <laughs> Verse 25, Numbers 13. When they returned from spying out the land, at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran. Am I reading too quickly? <laughs> There's a lot to get through. At Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. So they showed them the fruit of the promised land. Thus they told him and said, we went into the land where you sent us. And it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. So they go into the promised land, they get the fruit, they bring it back, and they say, yes, the promise is true. Then they says, nevertheless, that's the big but. And some of us have got big buts. <laughs> Don't take it personally. I'm talking about the nevertheless here, okay? He's saying nevertheless. He's saying, okay, yes, it's true. Yes, the promise is true. Yes, God's word says it. Here is the fruit of what God's word says, but. See, a, a truth in God's word, a promise in God's word that is not being written on my heart, that's my big but. Because I'm acknowledging the truth, that's what the scripture says, but it hasn't affected my heart. It's here in my head. I acknowledge that it's written in the Bible, but I don't believe it as true for me. 
Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong. These are the excuses. And the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, and it goes on and explains about the Amorites and the Hittites. And, you know, oftentimes we've got parasites stealing from us. Because we would rather believe the parasite than believe the promise of God's word concerning what does God speak over you? That God is speaking over you. He's calling out who you really are. Yet we'll go, yes, but. And then we blame our past, our education, our failures, our experiences, our spouse. (laughs) Not today, devil. eh? (laughs) But Caleb quieted verse 30 quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. The men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up. You always, when you start stepping into your identity and start believing the truth of what God says about you, you always have people who come with, well, you you know, Auntie Jo, she also believed, but she didn't, and come up with all of the criticism and the reasons why you shouldn't step into your identity. The land through which we have gone in spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, are part of the Nephilim. Those are the giants where Goliath came from. And then notice what it says. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. The way they viewed themselves was then projected onto how they, other people saw them. The way you see yourself is how other people will see you. So when you start walking in your identity as a child of God and it gets written on your heart, people will come up to you and say, you know what, there's something different about you. Do you belong to Jesus? Because the way you see yourself will be, other people will begin to see that about you. It's so important that we take the truth of our identity in Jesus and we begin to write a new sense of self on our hearts and we don't allow the limitations of our failures, our past, our disappointments, our excuses, our upbringing, our skin color, our bank account, hello, to, to determine who we are. Those are not a reflection of who you are. God's word and what he says is who you are. Let's believe it. So how do I do this? I'm glad you asked that question. We've got to look into the law of liberty. In James chapter 1, and this is very practical. I mean, the Bible is very practical. He says this. This you know, my beloved brethren, sistren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. I just want to pause here quickly. He's saying the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. The problem we have in religion is we have angry preachers preaching about an angry God thinking that it's going to promote holiness. Thinking that if we preach judgment and we preach fear and we preach conditions that it's going to get people to live right. And it's saying the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Being an angry communicator is not going to get people to live right. It's the goodness and kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Not anger. Preaching about an angry God is not going to change anybody. It will drive people away from him. And there's proof about that. When judgment comes... People curse God because they believe it's coming, that God is the author of their pain, and he's not. Moving right along, verse 21. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. So in the Greek here, when he says putting aside, is actually the reference here is take off a garment. So take off the sense that this is connected to who you are. He's saying, lay it aside, all wickedness and filthiness. He's saying, that's not who you are. 
Then he says, in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. He's saying, receive it. Take it with humility. Have an open heart where you begin to receive the word. Why? Because what does the word do? If I'm receiving it with humility, what will it do? Save your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions, your sense of self. Who you view yourself to be. How you feel in your heart about yourself. When I begin to receive the word with humility, when I st- humility means to agree with something. So I might have an opinion, but now I hear another opinion. I humble myself, I let go of my opinion, and I take this opinion. I'm humbling myself to say, I'm going to agree with God. That is what humility is. So when I begin to agree with God about how he views me, what he sees in me, I'm being humble. And when I'm humble and I receive that, that saves my soul. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude or deceive themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks in his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately has forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it or continues in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. So the word doer here is a Greek word which means to be a poetic performer or a creative artist. How many of you guys, I see there's a couple of gray hairs in the congregation, before TV, used to listen to the wireless? That's what my parents called it. They didn't call it the radio. They called it the wireless. I don't know why it was a wireless. Do you remember that program, Squad Cars? Okay, so some of you can remember. Some of you are too young. We grew up with that record with the, the fire engine. What was it? What was that fire engine? Sparky. Sparky. <laughs> Did any of you listen to that when you were a kid? Some of you. The point is, those guys on the radio would speak in a way that it sparked your imagination and you would be listening to the oak creeping in the dark. And you're listening to the radio and everybody's surrounded around the radio and there's emotions and everyone's scared because they're listening to the radio. Because what they are hearing is creating pictures in their mind and emotions in their heart. And this is what he says a doer of the word is. A doer of the word is when I'm listening to the implanted word of God, which is able to save my soul because I'm listening with the intent to create a picture in my heart and write an emotion deep within me. So he's not saying a doer is somebody who's just going to be doing, 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 doing. No, that doing is a byproduct of somebody who has written a belief on their hearts. That doing is not to earn righteousness. That doing is a response to an identity. And he's saying, I need to receive this word and not just be a hearer who looks into the word of God and walks away forgetting who he is. Being a forgetful hearer. He's saying, I need to be listening Activating my emotions, activating my imaginations to actually see myself the way God sees me. And that is what a doer of the word is. When I'm now activating my heart, listening with intent to create a new sense of self deep within me. That's good preaching. (laughs) And then he says that we need to continue in it. So he's saying this is not just a once off. That I do it once? No, I I do this continually because I'm now writing a belief on my heart. Why? Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The word, as a man thinks in his heart there in the Hebrew there, he's saying that the word think there is a doorkeeper. 
or a janitor, a gatekeeper. So my thoughts are the gatekeeper, but they influence my heart. So sometimes we need to change gatekeepers. We need to boot that bouncer and put a new one there. He says, otherwise, I deceive myself. I'm, I'm not deceiving others. I'm deceiving myself because I'm hearing, but I'm not hearing to write a, a new identity on my heart. And then I'm saying, I'm just deceiving myself. You know, we, and, and so often we are looking to external things to write an identity on our hearts. We can't do it. We, we need to be, have an internal reality that we're writing on our hearts to experience life. You know, you remember the story of, of Saul and David? David was a lighty, and Saul is vexed by a demon, and so he, they call for somebody who can come and play anointed music, so they call David. And David is playing. And the Bible says there that Saul was afraid of David and threw a spear at him. It doesn't say David was afraid of Saul who was throwing spears. Saul was afraid of it. You know, you can never receive what you refuse to bless. Okay, let me, let me put it this way. Let's make it practical. If in my heart... Because remember, your heart is a magnet. Everything flows out of your heart. Guard your heart, for out of your heart flow all the issues, boundaries of life. So if in my heart I see a wealthy person, and I then start throwing spears, and I say, you know, wealthy people are stingy, wealthy people, he probably got his money through illegal means, and wealthy opinion or opinionated, and I start making wealthy people out to be bad, my heart will never be open to being wealthy. Because I've just said, being wealthy is bad. That's good. That's good preaching. That is why God calls us to bless. Because what I refuse to bless, I will never receive. But if my heart is open to bless, guess what? The very thing that I need and want, I will receive. But if I'm throwing spears at the very thing that I need and want, I will never receive it. My heart is not open to it because my heart has said that's bad. And your heart won't receive what you believe is bad. <laughs> that is why it's so important that we get God's perspective of ourselves. Because when I'm receiving God's perspective, that God's opinion over me is now my reality where I believe that I'm blessed. Look at the person next to you and say, I am blessed. Because what you've just spoken is God's affirmation over you. Because God has said you are blessed. In Christ, you are blessed. So, it doesn't help that I'm throwing, and I just see it so often. It's like people will criticize, find fault, and judge others to try and make themselves look and feel better, but at the same time, it's just based on their own fears. And they see something good in someone else, they want that, but instead of blessing it, they throw spears. <laughs> If you look at the life of David and Saul, on the outside, Saul, the Bible says, was head and shoulders above everybody in the whole nation of Israel. Yet inside, he felt small. David, the Bible says, was small, but on the inside, he was big. And Saul tried to get David to wear his armor, an external identity that will protect him. And David was like, no, I don't need that. Because... Because I've got God with me. And we need to be God inside minded. Rather than trying to get our identity from these external things which we think will protect us. Rather than an inward reality. An inward reality of who we are in Jesus. Because when that begi begins to become my reality, then I start walking in the fullness of what God has for me. In Matthew 7... 
talking, Jesus talking about two foundations. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, and that's the same Greek word there, somebody who acts, somebody who's listening with intent to create a new sense of self, may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. When the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. He's saying stuff's gonna happen in life. The rains are gonna come, the storms are gonna come, but he's saying what's gonna make you stand? What's gonna make you stand is when you've heard the word and you've written beliefs upon your heart that when these things come against you and there's some stuff that comes against you, you don't know why or how or what's going on. You know, sometimes stuff happens because stuff happens. Moving along. That's for another message. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them, who does not listen with intent to create, who's not a poetic performer, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Listen to it in the message. I like this. These words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words, words to build a life on. If you work these words into your life, you are like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. Rain poured down, the river flooded, a tornado hit, but nothing moved that house, it was fixed to the rock. But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, You're like a stupid carpenter who built his house on the sandy beach. When a storm rolled in and the waves came up, it collapsed like a house of cars. (laughs) How often do we listen to a message and then we say, that was a great message. And then a week later, it was like, what did I say? And so he's saying, listen, we need to be hearing words. and, And let me free you up. For those of you who are in church or listening online, oftentimes there's a lot that's being said, but, it, but you will catch one or two things because you can sense God speaking to you. You need to switch me off in those times, and you need to say, Spirit of God, speak to me. And take note of what God is doing within you. If you are feeling inspired within you, I am secure enough to be okay with you switching me off, okay? But if you are feeling inspired by God, you need to be, in that moment, don't brush it off. That's when you need to be saying, okay, Holy Spirit, thank you that you're speaking to me right now. Write it down, make a note of it. Capture what you're sensing deep within you. Capture that emotion, dwell on it, meditate on it, think about it. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak within you. And what happens is then you are writing a belief on your heart. So that when you leave here, you can go back to that note. And it's like, oh, I want to capture that emotion again. How did that make me feel? And we want you to feel loved and accepted. That God is a good God. That all things are possible because you trust in Him. That's what we want you to feel. So, number three, my last point. How do we do that? Oh, look at the time. It always goes so long when Alfred preaches, but it's so, <laughs> so short when I preach. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding, okay? He's also secure enough to handle my jokes, okay? <laughs> I'm going to keep it short. We need to let go of false ideas. And this is what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not for the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. This is not talking about fighting the devil. There is no reference to the devil here, okay? This is talking about thoughts, imaginations, opinions, perspectives that we have. He's talking about a thinking here, which are powerful. They're strongholds in our minds based on our past, our experiences, and those things that have been written upon our heart. 
We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. The word disobedience there is also mean, is talking about unbelief. We need to be taking thoughts captive and saying, you know what, I'm putting off these limitations about my future, about my present, about my circumstances, and we need to be renewing our mind and we need to put on Christ because you are one belief away from walking into a miracle because God is a now God and the reality of his word and his presence is now and it's available for you and me. But I enter into that in the, in the realm of the heart first. Because I'm writing beliefs on my heart about who God is and who I am. And then I step into the realm of the miraculous. So this week I've been struggling with flu. So I don't go to God saying, God, please heal me. No, I become a poetic performer. And in, in, in my heart, I see myself as whole and healthy. And healed. So I'm not trying to get healed. No, I'm healed resisting sickness. I'm taking thoughts captive. Oh, you are just sick and you're struggling. No, I'm not. I'm healed. And I'm resisting sickness. I'm blessed resisting poverty. I'm anointed resisting the fear of not being good enough. It's about renewing my mind, taking thoughts captive. And you... Right now, this is who you are, children of God. This is how it's been revealed, and I'm going to close with this in 1 John 3. Beloved, now we are children of God. That is a present tense reality. That is who you are right now. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. He's saying, listen, It might not be reflecting in your life yet. It might not be manifesting. But the reality is you are a child of God in the realm of no condemnation, guilt, shame, or limitation. Right now, you are. It might not be revealed yet. It might not be manifesting in the way that you want it to be. But right now, just trust in Jesus. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. He's talking about Setting your heart apart to be purified. That's what it's saying. You set your heart apart to say, you know what? I'm tired of being limited by this old sense of self. And I'm going to step into a new reality and create a new sense of self based on what God says about me. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Suit up. Suit up. Amen? Put on who God says you are. God is always calling these things out of you. He's always showing you who he is. He's always done that. Remember Gideon inside the wine press threshing? And God says, come mighty warrior. He's like, no, I'm the smallest guy in the smallest tribe in the smallest place of Israel. He saw himself as small, and God said, no, you're a mighty warrior. Moses, I can't talk, I'm a stutterer. Moses, go and set my people free. Peter, on this rock, rock of revelation of Christ in you, God is always calling out who you are. And when you start believing what God says, you start stepping into what he has for you. Don't, you see, when my identity is connected to everything, anything external, if I can't do that thing anymore, then I fall apart. You're saying, no, be connected to an inward reality. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Look into the perfect law of liberty and become a poetic performer. Begin to speak from your own mouth what God speaks about you. Amen? Amen. And let go of all false ideas and opinions of you. Resist it in Jesus' name. Won't you stand to your feet this morning? Thank you, sir. Bow your heads this morning. Close 
your eyes, and this is just an opportunity for you to start connecting with your heart. Become spiritually minded rather than carnally minded. And to be spiritually minded means to look at things from a spiritual perspective. And a spiritual perspective is to see things from God's perspective where there is no limitation. So in your heart right now, maybe you've been limited, limited by what others have said about you or by a past experience or by a past disappointment or by your education or the color of your skin or your bank account. Maybe you are feeling limited by that. Well, right now you can put that off. You can lay it aside. You can throw that garment aside and you can step into the reality of how God sees you right now. As a child of God, where all things are possible to those who believe. As somebody who is anointed, who is blessed, who is favored of God, who has been redeemed. We sang that song this morning. All of heaven is shouting because you've been redeemed, brought back to a place where you can reign in life through being the righteousness of God and the gift of grace. You can reign in life. Step into that identity right now. Begin to see yourself the way God sees you as you are a child of His. Sweet child of mine. I just had a rock song come up in my heart. But that's what God's singing over you. Sweet child of mine. Step into that reality right now. Let go of these limitations. Let go of condemnation, guilt, shame, disappointment right now. Just send it away. Separate yourself from that. And step into the reality that God calls you blessed. Maybe you're standing here this morning. You've never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Maybe you've acknowledged Him, but you've never received Him. You must be born again. That means you need to allow the Spirit of God to come and live in you. If that's you this morning, you're standing here, you've never received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, but you can sense your Heavenly Father welcoming you home, inviting you back into a place of sonship. If that's you this morning, you've never made Jesus your Lord, but you sense God is saying, come home, child. I would love to pray with you. So if that's you and you want me to pray for you, with no one looking around, why don't you just slip up your hand so I can see you? And I'm going to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down again. Thank you. Can we just pray with those who raised their hands this morning? Just together, the Bible says, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. So we're just making a confession of what we've chosen to believe right now. So just pray after me. Just say, Heavenly Father, thank you that you love me. Thank you for the gift of your Son. I believe you died for me and you rose again and you are Lord of all. Thank you that I am the righteousness of God. I am your child, loved, forgiven, redeemed, blessed, adopted in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are highly favored and deeply loved of God.